Good to go. Good evening, New Hope Church, Palm Harbor. We are continuing our journey through the letter to the Hebrews, and we are in part 20. The title tonight is Body and Blood. Well, Melchizedek, Body and Blood. Yes, but the body and blood had more impact. I know. It, but anyway. <laughs> anyway, we'll be in Hebrews chapter 7 and uh, some other various scriptures as well. As always, won't you open up some word of prayer and we'll get into this, please. Okay. Heavenly Father, thank you, Jesus, so much for everything you've done for us, what we're learning about. Um, the fact that you want to commune with us is so fantastic. Lord, you are um, glad to be able to have us learn about this, to draw closer to you, to have more fellowship with you. And I just pray you'd give Tom and I the words to say, Holy Spirit, thank you for helping all of us have hearts and ears to hear and understand. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I've thought and prayed long and hard over this one, right? <clears throat> so <laughs> Something different. Yeah, something different. <laughs> We're going to be talking about the body and the blood, and which is the bread and wine. And we find all this as we got into Hebrews chapter 7, because everything in the, everything in the Bible is pointing to Jesus Christ. And everything in Hebrews, for the most part, is pointing to Jesus Christ as the high king and high, the priesthood, the, the order of Melchizedek. And that's where that more... That deeper teaching is found because in Hebrews chapter 5, the author kind of leans on them a bit for not really being where they ought to be. Then chapter 6, he starts off saying, you're, you know, you're, you're in this element, you're, in the, you're still in the basic things and you're not ready to move on just yet. And then he compliments them and encourages them. And then we get right into the next part of the letter, which gets us into that deeper teaching. He runs his head, head on until Melchizedek. And it's an interesting thing because Melchizedek up to this point is only mentioned two other times in the Bible, Genesis chapter 14 and Psalm 110. So we get into the deeper things, bang, you get to look at Melchizedek and go, okay, well, that's a deeper thing. We don't have a whole lot to go on here. So we need to, to flesh that out. So the point of this tonight, as we get into this, this priesthood of Melchizedek, the first thing we see is we research this, we go back to Genesis 14 and we see Abram comes back from the battle with the kings and Melchizedek comes down to meet him and gives him bread and wine. And the bread and wine, sorry Noah, the bread and wine is, the bread and wine is that which represents the, the body and the blood of Christ because that, that is not a coincidence that it's there. And then as we begin to explore what does that, what does that bread and wine what, what does that symbolize? What does that mean? What does that speak to? It speaks to the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. It was a foreshadowing of what he would do. Exactly. So, and then we get, and that gets into when we talk about the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, when you look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke as, a, as an example, you see the, the, the Lord's Supper, which is the, the, the body and the blood of Christ given, if you will, as, as, a, as a gift, as a, as a privilege to, to those who believe upon him. And what we're going to be talking about tonight is something I think is of, of, of a lot of importance. And that importance, at least the, 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 the conclusion that, that I've come to, that we've come to, is that the Lord's table, communion, if you will, the partaking of the sacraments, that takes place at a corporate level within the church. We talked about the various lanes, we talked about seven of them last week, the different positions the church has on the, the topic of the Eucharist or the sacraments. What we're talking about tonight is something that has been lost and it's something that needs to be restored. And that's the talk about our personal relationship with the Lord's table, partaking as a royal priest, as a, as a, a priest of Christ, called to that very thing. And so what I'm going to do tonight is, is we're going to build a case for you, and we're going to be repeating some scriptures. But I want you to go on the journey with me, because I think, again, there have been things, we're not looking to, we're not looking to say, okay, we've got some new discovery and there's some new, you know, a, a revelation or an evolution of doctrine. What, what I'm basically suggesting is that we, we're looking to restore that which has been lost. And what has been lost is that 
that, 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 that confidence and the regularity and the freedom and the permission to partake of the Lord's Supper in the privacy of our own home, as an example, as often as we, we choose to, as often as we do. And we come together corporately. We do that here at New Hope once a month, as is our tradition, and that's great and fine. Some churches do once a quarter, once a year, some do once a week or more. My conversation is not with the corporate aspect of this. I'm not looking to restore that. I think it's worth worth studying. Okay, well, how do we celebrate? Why do we believe the things we do? How did we end up in that train of thought? We talked about that last week. What we're talking about this week is what's this bread and wine mean to me? What does the body and the blood and the, and the, and the cup and the, and the bread, what, what does that mean to me? I know what it means that we do it in the church. and I know it's here, but what we're here to share with you is it means a lot more than you think. And it's something we need to partake of regularly. And it's been kind of marginalized throughout church history. And we're going to get into in that. In a way, preserved by the church because of the institution. They, they have preserved these things. They preserved the word. But in a sense, part of that was lost on the daily communion. Right. Or as we look in the if, when we look in the New Testament text, it's quite clear that there was a corporate get together where people came together and broke bread and and partook of the Lord's Supper, and they also ate together. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, and then we also see they met daily, house to house, sharing the Lord's Supper yes. and going house to house doing that. That that was the that was the the, the tradition, if you will. That's just what of it was. The early church. That's what the early mm -hmm. church did. New Testament, you can see that clearly. And then you look in the first 300 years until you get to the medieval church. I talked last week about the Nicene Creed in 325, and, and there, there's nothing there. That's just a kind of a benchmark place in history. Once you get into the medieval church, the more the church gets organized, and it's just a simple history of it, the more the language begins to change, like when the councils meet, the, the, you know, the councils of Carthage and all these places in the 200s and 300s, and you get into all these things that they begin to, they begin to basically add a lot of verbiage to the belief system and the organization. Who and the gets more to do they what. added, the more divisions came. Well, and the more divisions <laughs> came. And then you have this big, you, you have all these different ideas and beliefs on what is the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, communion, the bread and the wine, the body and the blood. And there, we talk about that typically at a corporate level. So what happens when you start looking at this, what I'm looking at is what, what does this mean on, on an individual level? First of all, in order for you to be, be able to, to, to buy into this, you have to be convinced of it scripturally that, well, it seems to speak to that. We, we, should, we are able to do this. Well, how come we're not doing it? Well, because we've been caught up in a tradition, nothing wrong with that. But the simple truth is that the, 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 what's become lost is the, 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 the personal participation in the Lord's table as it was meant to be. And as it always was until we got in four or five hundred years after you know, the year four or five hundred, then things began to kind of morph into something different. And the first 1,054 years until the Catholic Church, the Western Church, and the Greek Orthodox Church kind of split. And then the whole word, like transubstantiation, became, that was by Pope Innocent in 1201. Or, no, it wasn't him, was it? It was, um, yeah, Pope Innocent III. He's the first one to even use that language in 1202. So the whole talk of what the body and the, the, the bread and the wine meant they just took it as the presence of God. It began to try to define, well, what happens when you do this? And what does it become? Is it something just spiritual? Is it memorial? Does it mean nothing at all? Or is it something that, that, that there's a real presence? Or there's literally, a, a, it literally turns into the body. All these things are things that the churches, if you will, on a, on a big church. picture, those are the things that they basically they fuss about and they have and there's that's okay what i'm submitting to you tonight is simply this i'm going to stay out of that lane for now and i've been in that lane a bunch the last few weeks but but the 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 boots on the ground part of this is me okay what what has been lost 
What has been lost in my estimation as an ordained Pentecostal preacher is the same thing that was lost for about 1900 years with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. That wasn't a thing until La Souza Street or leading up to that. If you look at your church history, that was something that was lost for a very long time. But yet it was found, wasn't it? Then all of a sudden you have the whole Pentecostal movement that evolves out of that. I'm looking at this and saying, you know, I think something else was lost. The same type of thing was that our, 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 the gift to us, the permission to partake of the bread and the wine at, at home and corporately. Corporately we do it, and I think there's a, a little bit different, a couple different reasons to factor into that that we can get into. But let's read, if we can, uh, let's read some verses that are going to be repetitive, but it's important because you've got to get your head wrapped around. Otherwise, you go through this part of, of Hebrews, go, oh, Mekhazak, I'm not sure what that's all about. <laughs> no, you're going to know what it's all about as much as one can. There's a part of this that's absolutely Still a mystery. mystery. But that being the case, the writer to Hebrews is saying, this is where you need to be, guys. You need to kind of look at this because this whole new order, the priesthood, the, the order of Melchizedek is it's mentioned one time here, one time here. Now it's live. Now you have that order in Jesus. And what does that mean? What can we learn from that? So let's go ahead and dig through a bunch of verses. Just, but where we're heading is the body and the blood. That's where we're heading and what does that mean to me? And what can I leave here with tonight that will make a difference? So let's go ahead and pursue this. Hebrews 7, 1 through 4. This Melchizedek was king of the city of Salem and also a priest of God most high. When Abraham was returning home after winning a great battle against the kings, Melchizedek met him and blessed him. Then Abraham took a tenth of all he had captured in battle and gave it to Melchizedek. The name Melchizedek means king of justice and king and king of Salem means king of peace. There is no record of his father or mother or any of his ancestors, no beginning or end to his life. He remains a priest forever, resembling the son of God. Consider then how great this Melchizedek was. Even Abraham, the great patriarch of Israel, recognized this by giving him a tenth of what he had taken in battle. And we continue on in Hebrews 7. 6 through 7. But Melchizedek, who was not a descendant of Levi, collected a tenth from Abraham. And Melchizedek placed a blessing upon Abraham, the one who had already received the promises of God. And without question, the person who has the power to give a blessing is greater than the one who is blessed. And so this, this, this theme continues. We pick it back up in 24 and 25. Because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood. So the, Jesus is, that, that's the connection. The, the order of Melchizedek given to us in, in Genesis 14 is now fully, fully in blossom, fully envisioned and, and fulfilled in Jesus. Because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever. Therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. So the writer is setting Jesus in the order of Melchizedek is that new high priest in this new covenant, way above all the priests, all the types of old, including their father, Abraham. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is that guy. And he goes on and talks in Hebrew, it's Hebrews 7, 26. Let's read that. He is the kind of high priest we need because he is holy and blameless, unstained by sin. He has been set apart from sinners and has been given the highest place of honor in heaven. And we finish in verse 28. The law appointed high priests who were limited by human weakness. But after the law was given, God appointed his son with an oath. And his son has been made the perfect high priest forever. So Melchizedek is introduced to us in Hebrews as that one of those deeper things. And I would submit in Hebrews is probably the deeper thing, the mature thing, the thing that they were not quite ready for. What is there to learn? So let's dig it a little bit deeper. So when we begin to look at this case, okay, let's, let's start to basically parse out Melchizedek and the order of Melchizedek. Because Jesus is here in the order of Melchizedek. We only have two places to refer to plus Hebrews in the whole of the Bible, of course, but the, the, the source material is limited mm -hmm. on Melchizedek name proper. So let's go back to Genesis 14 and read that again. Verses 18 through 20. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem and a priest of God most high, brought Abram some bread and wine. Melchizedek blessed Abram with this blessing. 
Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has defeated your enemies for you. Then Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of all the goods he had recovered. Okay, so there we go. That's, that's source material one. Then we see him again mentioned, at least in, in, in Psalm 110, uh, we'll read verse four here, which speaks directly to this. God the Father, the Lord the Father said to the Lord the Son. This is God the Father speaking to God the Son. That's what Psalm 110 is doing, referring to Jesus. And it says here, the Lord has taken an oath and will not break his vow. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So we're trying to basically, trying to, to, to get your focus on Jesus is that guy. Are you seeing what I'm talking? It's clear, right? That's who we're talking about. And then we're going to talk about, okay, now let's go back and let's, just, let's, let's kind of dig into this a little bit. How did Melchizedek deal with Abram? Okay, that's a fair question. I need to learn about Melchizedek because Jesus is in that order. What, what was the example? He brought in bread and wine. Is that having a significance in the life of Jesus, bread and wine? Yes. I would say a great deal now, wouldn't it? I don't think that's a coincidence that that is there. That's obviously what it's talking about. So what I wanted to do is go to Luke and we're going to go to Acts because we have the same author. Luke was a physician. He tend to write, tend to write a little bit differently, a little bit more precise in, in some Detail. ways, I believe, because that's, he's a doctor. That's what they do, right? So now we're going to talk about the New Testament application of this as we come back into where we're at tonight in Hebrews. But talking exactly, more specifically, if you will, about the bread and wine, which means the, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. So let's read this out of Luke. Verses 19 through 20. He took some bread, which is Jesus, and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. So as believers in Jesus Christ, who have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, does this passage apply to you? Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Who gets to partake of the bread and wine? That would be, okay. how often do we do that? Do this what, in remembrance of me as often we, as you do it. How, who gets to do it? Who gets, who, who gets to do it? We, we, don't, we don't, see, it's been, it's the whole thing. We've kind of lost our way on that. We don't, we, we don't really own it, is it like we own, you read the word? Yeah, I read the word, I can tell you. You pray? Of course I pray. You fast? Well, maybe not quite so enthusiastic, but yeah, you get the drill. How often do you partake of the Lord's table? Well, we do it once a month at the church. What I'm suggesting is the Lord's table needs to be a part of your life, whether it be once a week or once every three. However, the Lord, however, that's going to be between you and the Lord. That's the thing. You have the permission to do it. What do I mean by that? Don't we have to have the church to do this? Don't we have to have someone, you know, pray blessing over it? Yes. And do we have to have someone who's, you know, perhaps authorized to do so? I would say yes. And what are those qualifications? Well, those who believe upon Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. Why? Because they are under the blood covenant. Jesus, once you accept Jesus Christ, you've repented of your sin, you repent and you accept Jesus, you are that you are one of those, you're a child of God. You are taken from the kingdom of darkness, put into the kingdom of light. You are a royal priest, a chosen generation, a king and a priest, John says in, in, his, in Revelation, we'll get into that in just a bit. But here's something else that I think that you need to think about just for a moment to give you more absolute positivity that yes, I need to look at this as something that perhaps we need to be doing more often because Luke 22, 29 and 30 says, just as my father has granted me a kingdom, I now grant you the right to eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, this is language that's already in, but not yet. We've talked about that in Proverbs quite a bit. You see that, that type of language, you know, it's easy to find that type of language, things that are, mean the now, but also mean the future. This right now, it's spoken of in Luke chapter 22, in the context which it's found, this is, you, you will have a hard time convincing me that this does not include the Lord's table. 
It includes the Lord's table and that table which is to come. How many of us believe that we will one day sit at the king's table and dine with him face to face? Yes. Someday. Do we all believe that? Amen. How many of us also believe that we have the right to sit at the Lord's table now and to bless the bread and the wine and to partake of his body and his blood? Why do, do we have to wait to do that? The answer is no. Do you have to wait to go pray somewhere? No, you, you, you have the right to pray and, the, and, the, and, and the, the privilege to pray. And I would say maybe the command to pray. You know, these are the things that we should do. Pray and study God's word. And, and, and then we say, you know, when we fast and, and when we give alms and all these things. And the, 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 the table, the, the Lord's table is as often as we do. Luther thought. People should do it like all the time. And that's just, we look at the early church and people just did it day by day. Let's go ahead and, 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 and read. Well, I've got to read this because this was just kind of, because we were in Proverbs forever, right? You see this bread and wine thing. Wisdom is lady wisdom in Proverbs chapter 9. You know, Jesus is wisdom incarnate. The New Testament, Paul talks about, you know, this Jesus is wisdom come. But it's interesting, the language we found, just Lori found this in Proverbs and said, hey, look at this. We, we, we talked about this. Go ahead and read that. Um, Proverbs 9, 4 through 6. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. As for him who lacks understanding, she says to him, come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Forsake foolishness and live and go in the way of understanding. So it's interesting that that would that wisdom is Christ Jesus. being the personification yes. says hey you, know, you need to turn in here if you lack understanding come eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed another coincidence perhaps in scripture but it is there so let's go ahead and talk about what Luke says in in the book of Acts because this gives us a further foundation is starting Acts chapter 2 verse 42 all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and prayer. Acts 2, 46, they worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared them, their meals with great joy and generosity. So now we get to Acts chapter 20, and so Paul is visiting here, and on the first day of the week, you know, we gathered local believers to share in the Lord's Supper. He was preaching. He was leaving the next day. He kept talking till midnight. So you think you got it tough on Wednesday nights? <laughs> you know, of course, Paul is probably arguably a better preacher, right? But, you know, so this, this kid, Eutychus, you know, he falls out in the spirit. <laughs> he fell asleep, fell out of a window. And they all, and, and so Paul went down. Of course, he's alive. Pray he's okay. He's Pray alive. for him. He's yeah. good. And they all went back upstairs in verse 11, shared in the Lord's Supper and ate together. So you see the Lord's Supper in this particular application. I believe the, the language here is there was also a meal in addition mm -hmm. to that. That yes. was a time together. That's also what was going on in the church in Corinth, by the way. And that kind of got out of hand. And we'll talk about that in just a bit. Matter of fact, let's talk about it next. Because Paul talks about this in his, I would say in his two letters to Corinth. The Corinthian church, Paul had been there. He was there for what, three and a half years, was it? I think. I don't remember. I think it's three and a half years. He, he's there. Uh, now I just feel like an idiot for saying that. I think it's, I try to remember all this stuff. I know, it it's hard to remember it's, every single I think thing, especially three. when it's numbers. Anyway, but he was there for a while, so he knows the people, right? So he starts off, and, and this, these are things we need to get our head wrapped around, because as we progress in this, there's also a chronology of when these books were written. You know, the Corinthian letters were written around 50, 55, 56 AD. You see Romans around 58, Hebrews probably 60, 62. The letters of Peter, probably 64, 65 ish. Revelation written probably 20, 30 years past that. So as you progress in this same, this same pattern of the Lord's table and who we are as, as royal priests, you see that theme develop. As scripture progresses, the story continues. To, to, it's like a flower that's blooming, if you will, that as the various writers, the Holy Spirit inspires them, all of a sudden this becomes, when you look, when you step back and look at what the scriptures in their entirety say about it, it's like, I see this now. So what's he say right off the bat? Don't you know that you are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you? That's an identifying statement, isn't it? You're a temple of God. Okay, now th we... we we, we say that, but there's, that means something. You are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you. That's a big thing to say, isn't it? 
Let's go on to the next thing here. And he talks about keeping the feast. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you read a bunch of these. <laughs> but in, in 5.8, and this is, I'm just kind of scripture weaving here and trying not to get anything out, out of the lanes too far. But the, let's keep the feast not with old leaven or with the leaven of malice and wickedness. But here's the thing I want you to the, the key on. The unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. That's what we're looking for they here. They served unleavened bread at Sin the time of the Passover and communion. And the sincerity and truth is, is that's, I think that's the key here. Let's go on to the next one. As we talk about what Paul says, okay, this is, you know, the, the, he starts to talk more about what we're going to get into. Let's go ahead and read this in chapter 10. Verses 16 through 18. When we bless the cup at the Lord's table, aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ? And when we break the bread, aren't we sharing in the body of Christ? And though we are many, we all eat from one loaf of bread, showing that we are one body. Think about the people of Israel. Weren't they united by eating the sacrifices at the altar? And so he says in 1 Corinthians 10, 21, he kind of continues to, continues to talk about this theme, if you will. You cannot drink from the cup of the Lord and from the cup of demons too. You can't eat the Lord's table at the table of demons too. Okay, you know, if you think about this, these two passages... When we, when we bless the cup at the Lord's table, aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ? When we break the bread, aren't we sharing in the body of Christ? And you can't drink from the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. It seems to me, that, to be honest with you, these two passages speaking of the Lord's table, it seems to be something more than just symbolic. Because there's a little bit more of an edge to this. He says this is something more than just that. And then he says in 1 Corinthians 11, 17, 18, you know, we, we talked about this last week. It sounds like there's more harm than good is done when you meet together. Why? Because there was some, there was some, there was some tension in terms of proper protocol. And they're yes. just, they weren't mm -hmm. just handling it right. And, and then he says in 1 Corinthians 11, 20, when you meet together, you're not really interested in the Lord's Supper. This is what Paul's writing to them. So then he finally gets to the place now, a little bit later, this is how you do this. Let's go ahead and read this in 1 Corinthians 11. And this, these passages we're all familiar with, right? 23 through 26. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Okay. So we've got this down, right? This is my body. This is my blood. This is the cup of the new covenant. And, and, and so we, we see the imagery again, the bread and the wine. Remember, we saw that in Genesis chapter 14, didn't we? The bread and the wine. We see the bread and the wine becomes the body and the blood. And then, the, then, then Paul writes, following this, that to be careful when you do this. And I think this perhaps, this perhaps is, is kind of what's kind of inserted a wedge that has been a little bit easier for tradition to relegate the Lord's Supper to more of a corporate affair as opposed to something that we can do every day if one would choose to in the privacy of their own home with their spouse or with friends or whatever. Or by themselves. Yeah, by themselves. Let's go ahead and read that whole passage about the caution. And the reason there's a caution, because they've been given, Jesus has given us the right to eat at his table, right? This is something, this is something that only the Christian has. This is not for everybody. Okay, so, and, and, and there's a little bit of a rule book that goes with this. Why? Because this is a special thing. This is a special thing. So let's go ahead and read those passages. He, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 32. So anyone who eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and some have even died. But if we would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. 
Yet, when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world. Okay. That would, it gives us pause, right? And it should. And it should. And so you spend a lot of time praying and reading. And, and the whole thing, just to give you some backdrop, you know, all the current books on communion, the Lord's Supper, you know, you've got to read all the traditional. Then, of course, you've got to come up to date and, you know, read the Randy Clarks and the Bill and Benny Johnsons and Perry Stones and, and uh, Joseph Prince. I read all their books this last two weeks. So all these, that's the common that kind of the common, more pop-type culture books in Pentecostalism. I've read all those. And they're, they go farther than they should, I think. They, they're certainly lend some light to it, and they're worth reading. But I think And they, Perry they, Stones they, is, is the closest to being a good teaching yeah, on Yeah, I think, I think they, they push it. I think that they, they push it too far. Here, here's what I think the problem is, which we have discussed, is that the books, when you read about the communion books and the Lord's table, it is all very much about what we can get out of it. It's not about this fellowshipping with the Lord and spending time with him, examining yourself, you know, lining up with the Lord, making sure that we are in that right place with him. It's all, the books are very much a bless me. If I do this, I'm going to be blessed. Well, and Yes, and it's, and that's, I bought their book, so I mean, I'm helping support the cause, right? <laughs> so, but I think it's the same type of lane sometimes that can, people can get in. If you quote these scriptures, this alone, these things are going to happen. If you, if you say these things in prayer enough and loud enough, they're going to happen. And if you do communion this way, this is going to happen. That's not what we're about tonight. Right. That's not what we're about this, tonight. This is, this is what we're trying to restore. What we're trying to restore is the table. Yeah. In your life. If you have an altar in your house, let it be the Lord's table. That's your right to do. And when we talk about this, this examine yourself. And I've, here's how we're, here's how I'm going to frame this. And I want you to Listen. And there's a lot of ways you can frame this, but here's the way I believe for my time. I'm not going to say God told me, but I, <laughs> this is how this is going to go. I would challenge you to look at that examination of yourself before the Lord's table. To look at it almost through the lens of a marriage relationship. It's kind of like this. It's about love. It's about your faithfulness. It's not about a checklist of doing this and doing this and doing this and doing this. Jesus, your brother, your brother, he's called, we're part of the brotherhood. Look at the language of Hebrews. We're, he is our Lord and our King and our High Priest and our Savior. He's God in the flesh. He's also our brother. He calls us his brothers and sisters. He's saying, come in. Come behind the veil. You could never come here before. I've, I, I made it, guys. I'm here for you. Come to me. Eat of my, eat the bread and drink and, and drink the wine. Eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. And but examine yourself before you do this. Why? Because the first, the two things you you go. Okay, I got to repent. No, yeah, maybe you do need to repent, and you certainly need to ask God to forgive you for sin. But the two questions that just kept pounding me is in a marriage relationship. No matter what I say to her, do I love you? Yes. Do I love you? Because if I don't love you, I have no right at that table. If I don't love you, I have no right at that table. And then the question is, and that's the exa then the examination part. The examination part, you know, have you been faithful? Yep. Have you been faithful? Are you faithful? And here's the rub. You're saying, no, I haven't been faithful. And the Lord said, it's okay. I'll forgive you. Come in. That's the examination. Because in, in the time where I was thinking of the same thing about the examining yourself, I could definitely see how there could be an opposite of not coming to the Lord 
because of that fear or insecurity of being able to partake in this fellowship with him. But do you think you're unworthy? Because Jesus communed with the 12 disciples. Judas would betray him. Peter afterwards would deny him three times. The rest would scatter when Jesus needed them. But Jesus knew this, and he still offered communion to them. So that is something that if you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you are walking and wanting to walk with him, that being faithful, you know, you're, you're trying to do the right thing, doesn't mean you're perfect, but you're trying to do the right thing, then you are worthy. And that's the message, too, that we want to bring out, is you are worthy to do this because Jesus made us worthy. Yes. And that's the thing. As a child of God, you love him. Because what happens is that as you begin to, to implement or to begin to, to I mean, it's, it's kind of like we've got five senses as humans, right? It's kind of like one of the senses that you never had. All of a sudden, you can smell now. You didn't even know you couldn't smell, but wow, what, wow, I can smell that. I mean, wow, it was missing. I didn't know that was even there. You know, communion, the Lord's table. It's kind of like something being restored that was always there for us, but it got lost in the shuffle. And I, what I mean by lost is not lost corporately because all churches in their tradition have a way to, 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 to participate and facilitate. facilitate communion. But again, what's not ever talked about is, okay, what about the individual as a child of God? What We're invited to do this. How often can we do it? And, who, and what are the ground rules for doing it? And if I can do it, and Jesus, and, and, and here's the thing about communion, about the bread and the wine. Jesus is the one who instituted this. It's the only thing you have. I mean, I'm just telling you, the Lord's the one who did it, not me. He could have just said, think happy thoughts, think this, confess this, and, and, and prayed. He, he, and we do all that. But he also said, the, this is, take this bread this and hold it. Thing. Take this wine and hold it. Eat my body, drink my blood. And that's more than symbolic because there's a lot of easier ways to do that symbolically than say, this is bread, my, my flesh, and this is the, the wine, my blood. It's for a reason. We get to participate. He involves the physical in that particular act of worship. There's a very physical thing happening. You are partaking of the body and the blood of Christ. And you're saying, well, what does that mean? Is it just a wafer and juice? It is until you speak the blessing over it. And then what happens then is the, is the natural basically turns into the divine. That's where the mystery happens. But it's in my mind and understanding of this in the early church and what seems to be here. It's, it's, it's symbolic, but in memorial, but it's so much more. And this is something, it's like, well, what can I get out of, what, 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 what's going to happen in my life if I begin to partake of communion in my home? I don't know. What would you say to someone who says is a new Christian? What would ha what's going to happen if I start praying? I, I don't know. But I would say if your heart's right, I think we would all agree that something perhaps will happen if you pray mm -hmm. with the, fervently and with the right heart, Right. Well, what happens if I spend time reading the word and learning the word all the time? What's that going to do for me? It will do something for you. Well, what happens if I, if I take this fasting thing seriously and begin to fast? Something will happen. Absolutely. There are just things that we're given. There's, 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 there's patterns here that if we, even the keeping the Sabbath holy. Another, it's like, well, I don't have to do any of that. Because I'm, I'm, it's grace. Okay, got you. That's okay. And the, and the baby pulls down here, and we've got that for you. However, Hebrews is saying, get out of the baby pool yeah. and move on. His, his, the, ride, the, the author's right, not mine. Where do we find ourselves when we move on? We find ourselves, bam, right in front of Melchizedek. Here's your bread and wine. Deal with that. Explain it. What's it mean? So, corporate communion. 
has a different feel to it than individual communion. Mm. So corporate communion has a corporate body of Christ feel. We're all here, we're all together. It's like a safe place. You're standing with a body in unity, but it's safe, right? You feel, I feel, the safety of it, right? I've never thought of anything different than other than it being a safe thing. But individual communi communion, in my experience, is absolutely more intimate, even in a piercing sort of way. It's very direct. It's kind of like in your face because it's Jesus and it's you. And we take communion together too. But even still, I feel like that individual communion is like you are in the spotlight. You, it's you and Jesus right there. But what I want to say is don't shy away from it. Embrace it. And ultimately, trust your Savior and brother who sacrificed himself for you to make this possible. Again, he wants you to be there. He wants to have this sup with you, this relationship, this fellowship. But I just thought that was, I just wanted to express how the corporate communion definitely is a different feeling than the individual communion. Well, and okay, let's, let's, no, we're going to speed through the first Peter verses real quick, just for a moment. I just want to set this a little bit deeper. And this is talking about, this is later on. This is a fleshing out of this. First Peter 2, 4 through 5, you're coming to Christ, who's the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. You are the living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. Temple. Who? You. You. You are his spiritual temple. You are his holy priest. Who is his holy priest? That would be you. Okay, that, that, this is what this says. You need to deal with this. This is who you are. You're, you're, you are saved and you're a child of the king. You're also a priest of the king. And that's, that's that, okay, that, that starts amping it up just a bit. In, in 1 Peter 2 9, it says, You're a chosen generation. Are you a chosen generation? Well, then by definition, if you're, if you're going to agree to that, you're also what? A royal priesthood. What does that mean? Does a royal priesthood have the right? Does the royal priest have the right? A, a, royal, a royal priest? Does it not make sense that a royal priest would meet with the high priest in the order of Melchizedek to break bread and wine with the very one who's called them to be a royal priest? Who in the world wants to stand in the way of that transaction? Hear what I'm saying. Who wants to stand in the way say, no, you cannot do that. But hold on. The high priest is saying, I'm a chosen generation. I'm a royal priest. I'm his own special people. He goes on to say in 1 Peter 2, he says, we re we've turned to our shepherd, the guardian of our souls. I want to be close to that guardian of my soul. I want to have that intimacy. And we see John talks about Revelation 1, 6. What's he, talk, what's he say here? He has made us a kingdom of priests for God, his father. Who here is part of that kingdom of priests? Amen. Is that you? Are you a royal priesthood? Yes or no? Are you a chosen generation? Yes or no? Does the, does the, does the, does the bread and the wine, is that belong to you? Yes or no? How often? As often as you will. Full stop. And nothing changed about that for hundreds of years. Nothing changed. Nothing changed. You're saying, okay, what happens if we begin to institute this into our life? I don't know. I think it's just a silly shame that we would leave it out knowing what we now know. Because it's clearly there. And you're going, well, Pastor Tom, how... I just discovered this, man. Okay, I'm just going through here. I got out of Romans, went in Proverbs, and I just, serial tasking, right? I get on something, I'm going to run that baby to the ground. That's expository. You got to look at the whole thing, then you're going to funnel that down. Why? Because you're in it. And once you get to this place, and, you, and you, you're in it, and you start reading 7, 8, 10, 12 books on what are they talking about, then what the scriptures say, you say, well, all these different traditions, okay, let's go back, 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 let's go back and see what they actually believed. They believed just what the word said. There was a corporate coming together on the first day of the week where they partook, and there was also people going every day house to house partaking of the Lord's table. Okay, it wasn't either or, it was both. 
The restoration here tonight is to incorporate the second leg of that that's been left out. You at home, as often as you will. And you're saying, well, how often should I? I can't answer that for you. I do know that it's something that the Lord wants. Mm -hmm. There's, you can't think about what I'm saying. There's not much you can think of. There's just not. There's not much you can think of that's more intimate. That's more intimate than praying this blessing <laughs> upon the bread and the wine. And then partaking of the body and the blood. Because it's the word of God that causes that, that transformation. That, that presence, if you will. And it's more than just, I mean... You see, like, I mean, come on. You look at the, look at in, in what, Luke 24, you look at after, the, after he rose from the dead, on the road to Emmaus. So these two guys are cruising, they're walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, seven miles. Jesus kind of locks, locks in with them. They don't know who he is. He, he, he was hidden from their sight. He couldn't see that. And so later on, you know, he, they, they say, oh, stay with us and all. I still don't know who he is. And so he, he, what's he do? He breaks bread and gives it to them. And their eyes are open. And then what does Jesus do? Does a Houdini. He disappears. Mm -hmm. Explain that. He was there. He disappeared. Physically there. He went somewhere else. The bread and wine. Is physically here. When we pray God's word on it. It becomes something else. A mystery. And if you wait to try to figure out, well, how did Jesus do the disappearing trick? You figure that one out, you'll probably figure other things out too. But this is beyond your pay grade. I'll just help you. Not going to figure that out. And you're not going to figure out the mystery of the bread and wine. But here's the, here's, the, here's the trick. The bread and wine is yours. And you need to start. You need to start practicing that. Because it's just like prayer. It's just like reading the word. It's just like fasting and giving alms. It's, and it's... And I would say that it's, it's as intimate as you can get. And when you do this, I've, you know, I've administered the sacraments many times corporately. As we begin to do this individually, it makes you stop and think, right? Mm -hmm. So here's what we do corporately. And there's nothing wrong with this. This is what we, there's a, there's a, a there's, we read, we pray, we we, we go through a, a, a progression of things that we do in, in order to celebrate it corporately. And that's because it's corporately and you got to do things a bit different. It, yeah, you can't quite yeah. do so, it on that mass So level. individually, when Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock in Revelation, they open the door, come in, so we'll have a meal together. Get that in your head here. When you're having the Lord's table in the privacy of your own home, you're having a meal at the Lord's table. And it's not just, this is not a drive through It's a time where you can sit there, whether it be one minute or an hour. It's a moment in time. You have invoked the blessing. You're the one who's calling the Lord's table because the grape juice or the wine and the, the matzo bread or the bread or whatever you're using, that, just be, that remains just a juice and a bread until what? Until you speak God's word over it. Then what happens? Then it becomes the body and the blood. And when you have that private time of partaking of the body and the blood of Christ, because he says, you have my permission to sit at this table and eat of this. When you take that time to do it, I would encourage you to spend time in that moment. Spend time in that moment. You don't have to go anywhere. You're the most important place, arguably, you can be at that moment in time. You're at the Lord's table. You've You've proclaimed, you've, sent, you've sanctified or proclaimed blessing on the sacraments. You do this. This is how you do this. As you do this in your home, you, ha you have instituted the Lord's table. What gave you the right to do that? Well, I'm sorry. Aren't you a royal priest? Didn't he say that you're a kingdom of priests? I mean, what other qualifi qualifications do you need? The high priest is calling his priesthood to him and saying, come behind the veil. Something you could never do before. Come to the Holy of Holies. 
And I believe that, this, that, that the Lord's Supper, communion, the Lord's table, the Eucharist, what, the sacraments, the bread and the wine, the body and the blood, those offer opportunity for a relationship. It, a, it offers a different dimension that, that we do well to participate in. There is no upside that I can see, and I can see nothing scripturally, I can see nothing in the first several hundred years of church history that would discourage anyone from going to the Lord, examining themselves, and we tried to frame that in the sense, do you love him? Because if you don't love him, why are you here? And here's the thing about that. We talk about you know this judgment that comes upon you. Don't try to play Jesus, okay? He already knows. You're not, you're not hiding anything from him. When he says examine yourself, he already knows, but yet he calls you. But he calls you to examine yourself first. You say, well, I don't need to do that. Well, now you've got a problem because you think you're smarter than him. And it ain't going to work. So you examine yourself. But the thing to look at, do you love him? And have you been faithful? And we talked about this. If you haven't been faithful, what a perfect opportunity to ask forgiveness right then. To start anew. That's all you have to do. Ask Jesus to forgive. Now, also, you know, this whole act of communion is really a separation time, too. It's a time of holiness. You are making a stand to be separate from the world. The world doesn't do this. They can't no. participate in this. So we, as a born-again believer, when we participate this way, is we are making a stand in the world's eyes and saying, yeah, we are separate. We are set apart. We are sanctified. We are holy because of Jesus. And even as we do it in the body of Christ, we are set apart. It's an act of holiness to do yeah, this. It, it, you know, I mean, ride with me on this because all this begins to make sense, right? You know, what's it mean the fear of the Lord and the reverence of the Lord? You begin to proclaim the Lord's table in your home, you'll know exactly what it means to have fear and reverence of the Lord. Because you're proclaiming the Lord's table. He says, examine yourself and come. And we, by definition, I know from my own experience at home, yeah, the whole fear and right. It's not like I'm fearful that it's like, okay, this is a serious thing. I mean, I'm, I'm in the presence of my high priest here who happens to be the king, who happens to be God in the flesh. I mean, you can't get any higher on the food chain than Jesus. I'm getting ready to initiate. I'm getting ready to call a meeting. I'm ready to institute the table. Of remembrance, but also in doing that, there there is not just a remembrance. There is a tran, There's a tran, There's a there's an exchange. I mean, anytime you meet with a friend or a loved one, someone you really want to be with, someone who really loves you and you love them, you always come away richer and better for that yes. meal, right? Mm -hmm. You will always come away somehow different. I believe by exercising and just and just growing in this. In, in this, this gift we've been given, we've been given the Lord's Supper, the Lord's table. And again, you go back in history and it's like, why aren't we doing this today? Well, because it got wrapped up in church tradition. And I'm not having to go with the church because every church has their own idea on this. What I'm talking to is you, the Christian who loves Jesus. This is for you. Mm -hmm. It was always for you. At the early church, everyone did it individually and corporately. Mm -hmm. And you're saying, what was the benefit of that? I don't know. I just don't. I, can't, I cannot promise you, like, if you do this, all this is going to happen. But man, I know this. This is special. This is special. I mean, when Jesus says, this is my body and this is my blood, you eat and drink this. I think it means something. It means something more than just paying homage. Spurgeon really thought it was a nourishing of the soul, a, um, a comfort, a, um, not just intimacy, but he really took it. Of course, his verbiage is always flowery, which I don't have right now, but he talked about that as far as a, an encouragement, nourishment, a spiritual uplift in every way. So, Yeah, and I can't help myself but go... I mean, if we look at lost things that have been found, if we look at the Pentecostal revival, go back to the late 1800s, you go back a little bit earlier than that, but I mean, to get some teeth in it, you go back to the late 1800s, early 1900s, the Sousa Street and beyond, you have a, a, a reemergence 
of the full gospel Pentecostal experience, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, and all the gifts that go with that. You know what I'm talking about. What did that add? What did that add? I would say it added a great deal to the body of Christ. Why? Because they are walking in the power that we should always have been walking in. But that was lost, literally lost for hundreds of years in that sense. We look at this, and I'm looking at this and saying, well, has this ever happened before? I mean, I was like, I'm going to start preaching that you need to start doing this, or you get to start doing this, or you should start doing this, or why aren't we, start, why aren't we doing this? And you start looking at the history of it, and you're going, doggone it. I mean, this, may, this is kind of like one of those things, something we should have always been doing. And then when you see it, you're going like, wow, there that is. Why don't I do that? And again, like we, and again, and I know those are two different topics. I don't want to stretch the, the, the context of it. But the simple truth was something did happen at Azusa Street that hadn't happened before that. And, and, and with, with Charles Parm and Topeka, Kansas and all that, all that really did happen. And we also see now that we start looking at this and some people are starting to talk about this. When you look at Francis Chan is, is all on board with this and even Hank Canegraaff, believe it or not, and all the Pentecostals. And you have all the, all the churches have an opinion on this, but nobody talks about everyday people believers in Christ who are royal priests, kings and priests, according to God's word, we are under the blood covenant. He is our high priest, our brother, our, he's inviting us to come in. He says, your anchor's back here. Come on in, examine yourself first though with the Lord's table. And that's two different topics there. I understand that. But the, the, the point being is the same, it's the same pattern. He wants fellowship yes. and he wants truth and love. That's it. Honesty. Let's and just be honest. And will we benefit from it? Yes. It's, this is the covenant that he has promised. The New Testament and all the promises within that, within the covenant, are for us. But is that what it's all about? No. Yeah, it's, it's and it keeps, and this is just me, and this is my lens, and this may not be your lens at all, but for me it's a lens almost. I mean, it kind of keeps you on the straight and narrow in the sense that, you know, you'll be proclaiming the Lord's table this weekend or tomorrow, whenever that. And the, what that means is, you know, I, I, you know, I need to. Yeah, this is I need to I, I need to I need to I need to follow Christ on this. I need to be less fleshly. I need to do this or I need to Lord. I, and here's the thing. And I've talked to the Lord about this quite. If he was looking for some perfect person to come in and have fellowship, I would never see the light of day on this. This is not about <laughs> that. Would. It's yeah. about, OK, as a blood purchased, you know, you know, child, child of the of king, God. child of God. Can I do this too? He said, yeah, I'll give you permission to do that. He gave you us know, the right. Give us the right to do it. Well, how do I do it? Okay, here's how you do this. Now, before you do it, just, you know, just, just be real. Don't, don't, just, just be honest. That's what this is about. He's calling you. He's just saying, be honest. You love me and you've been faithful. Are you trying? Is your, is your, do you, you, are you following me to the best that you can? You love me as much as you know. The danger is, is when I say I love you and I'm sleeping with five other women next week. I'm just saying, <laughs> you, you get the point? There's a difference, right? I can say it. But I'm not really living it. That's the warning. Examine yourself. Because if you're trying to play me, Jesus is saying it ain't going to work because I already know. This is actually, in a sense, in a sense, it's almost about you being honest with yourself, being real. And he's saying, that's okay. You're saying, well, Lord, I just did this and this. He said, that's okay. I still want you to come. He wants you to ask for forgiveness and repent. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins and trespasses. That's a daily thing, right? This and is not I feel like new. the way that the Lord's table is set up, it does correlate like the Lord's prayer. Because in the Lord's prayer... Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We give God the, the praises first, right? Then we start asking for, for all the rest of it. In the Lord's table, it is where take, eat. This is my body. Okay, Jesus, this is your body. I know it was broken for me. I know that you willingly accepted the cross and to be able to make this opportunity for me so I can partake. Yes, Jesus, this is your blood. This is what I'm going to partake in. The blood was what was shed for me 
forgave all my sins, and I ask forgiveness for all my sins. And then that way, when we come to him and we have this whole time with him, we're putting the focus on him first. And then we can go in, and yes, Lord, I ask healing for such and such. I ask provision because your covenant promises that for us. Right. And we're running a bit late tonight, so let's close with this maybe in the sense that, you know, how do you do this, right? So I think we have, and if you need these notes, you know, we can send these to you too. We've got more notes. We've got enough stuff, book of stuff here. <laughs> but, you know, what we did is just get some orga organic grape juice or I had an old bottle of red wine from years ago. I just... You, yes, if you can't drink and, wine, and, don't worry yeah, about it. It's not, it's it's not even juice. about that's that. It's do. totally just cool. Just having having a bottle of been there for a might as well use that, right? So well, you're, it's, that's what it's going to be used for. And then we, I ordered a, a box. I didn't know how much I'd order. I ordered like a suitcase full of <laughs> right. unleavened, you know, matzah, <laughs> matzah or, bread. kosher matzah bread from Jerusalem. <laughs> so I'm going to really be close to the Lord with mine. But <laughs> it's, uh, so you get all that. And then you basically, you know, we individually, I just... Filled the thing full of wine and took a pretty or good grape juice. Grape juice took a pretty good chunk of bread. The thing, not just a wafer. And I had my private time, and it was, it was a bit, you know, because I wasn't afraid to go into communion. I mean, my gosh, it's. I mean, I know who I serve. Why would I be afraid to do that? I mean, that's the. That's the I mean, no, it's not like exam, yeah, I'm examining myself, and yeah, I, Lord, I. But you know my heart, and here I am. I want to be there. I want to be there. I want to be there. It's like, well, you better because, yeah, I know. Sometimes I need to have my butt held to the stove to make sure I'm not doing stupid stuff. Examine yourself because you're going to proclaim the Lord's table and we're going to have a chat. You're going to partake of my body and my blood. Don't be, don't be silly. Be, be real. I mean, that's what this is. I know I'm trying to, the vernacular is not right. And I apologize if I, you know, I don't try to insult or be stupid here. It's about relationship. Yeah. He loves you. He's saying, come. He's saying, come. Just be real. If you say you love me, mean it. If you mean it, come on. Eat of my body and drink of my blood. What's going to happen next? You'll never know till you get there. I'm done for tonight. I mean, I could talk about this. I mean, I've been in this man. This is so real, and we've just missed it. We've missed it. I've missed. I'm a teacher. I'm, I'm looking at this, and I'm digging and digging and digging and digging. Reading. I mean, you cannot believe. And this is why we do this. So and and I'm looking. Around. Okay, what am I missing? And it's it's. We just haven't done it. It's like you you can't find something that says you don't do this. No, it was. As the more the language changed in the councils and the doctrines of the organized church, whatever that is, the more that the more it kind of got delegated to the powers that be, along with baptism and and those things. And that's okay. I'm not going to have a go at that tonight. The simple point of it is, it was always ours. It was always ours. It was always ours. And I'm just suggesting we ought to just start taking what, taking what is given to us and using it. Because it was given to you by Jesus, not just somebody. Are we done? We're done. Noah, take us out of here. Hey, share this video. And, and somebody needs to get this, man. This is important. This, this is the deep stuff. Think of it. It's not like, no, this is real. This is real. Noah, take us home. Hey, Wednesday Night Family, Noah here, and um, just wanted to say thank you for coming out or tuning in online. Um, these past few weeks, we have been covering Melchizedek. Um, I know that a couple weeks ago, we talked about uh, the different theories around who he was, um, where he came from, that type of thing, which was super interesting. Um, but these past couple weeks, we've been talking about um, the breaking of bread and wine, um, and communion in general, its historical context and um, what part it should be playing in our lives today that it currently doesn't, um, or you know, what part it should be playing within the church society as a whole that maybe it doesn't right now. Um, and one thing with communion is that without faith in God or you know faith in Jesus, 
communion is just bread and wine or bread and grape juice. There's no um, divinity to it yet. Um, so the requirement there is that you're a believer, that you are in the family of God, um, that the elements can be you know, consecrated and spoken over, um, that they can have that divine mystery uh, that is imparted into them uh, when you are a believer and you do pray over them. So if, um, you know, maybe you're new to the church or maybe you're old to the church, um, regardless, uh, if you want to make a commitment right now to allow God into your life and to accept Jesus as your Savior, to um, be able to have confidence in your salvation, then I would ask that you join me in this prayer. It's a prayer of repentance and invitation of Jesus coming into your life, um, accepting that he's the Son of God and that he died on the cross for your sin, um, but then also that he rose again and that he's alive today, sitting at the right hand of the Father. The Bible says that he's interceding for us right now. And I know that God is beckoning, he's yearning for a relationship with you. And maybe you've been on the fence for a while, but right now I'm asking that you would answer the call that you would open the door that Jesus is knocking on of your heart. So, if that's you, uh, go ahead and join me in this. Dear Heavenly Father, I come before you a sinner in need of a Savior. Lord, I ask that you would forgive me of my sin and that you would cleanse me of my unrighteousness. Jesus, I declare with my mouth and I believe in my heart that you are the Son of God, that you died on the cross to pay my sins penalty, and that you rose again and conquered death. So Jesus, I pray that you would be with me, and that you would guide me, and that you would help me be bold with my faith and not hide it. God, I pray that you would help me break any bad habit that I have, or any sin that is currently holding me back, I pray that it would be released right now in Jesus' name. And in his name I pray. Amen. And if that was your first time praying that prayer and you're looking for contact in the church, um, go ahead and send an email to noah at newhopepalmharbor.com or if you have a prayer request, you can send it there as well. Um, but I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your week. And we look forward to seeing you next Wednesday. See you.